everyone to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood. This is our Lessons from the Road uh, series, and this is our election uh, special. So we're going to be talking about the election, kind of what, how to think about you know, what's happening, what some of the dynamics are in that, and how to think about the time after the election's over, and how we like manage our own energies and, and all that. So we're so glad that you're joining us tonight. Um, my name is Terry Kylo. I'm with Paths to Understanding, which is formerly Neighbors in Faith in the Tracy Levine Center. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that, that, that Anila and I are currently standing on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples, and we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Coast Salish peoples themselves. And, and Alana, where are you? I'm in Maryland, so we are here on the land of the Piscataway people um, who are um, actually traditionally spread all over the East Coast, and there's a, a large number of them up in Baltimore, but the land that I stand on is theirs. Thank you. So that, that was Alana Suskin. She's an educator, activist, and writer. She's the editor of the progressive blog, JewSchool.com. She served as assistant rabbi at Addis Israel in Washington, D.C. She reaches across faith traditions to fight Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, and together with Hamza Khan, who can't join us tonight, they have founded the Pomegranate Initiative to counteract Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. Welcome, Alana. And then Anila Afzali tonight is joining us. She's the founder of Maps Amen, the American Muslim Empowerment Network. She's an activist, public leader, and a member of the board of the Faith Action Network. And I'm Terry Kylo, the executive director of Neighbors in Faith, or of, excuse me, of Paths to Understanding. In the first debate, uh, President Trump said, proud boys, stand back and stand by. But I tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left. A few days later on Fox News, he said, I condemn the KKK, I condemn all white supremacists, I condemn the Proud Boys. I don't know much about the Proud Boys, almost nothing, but I condemn that. So how did you two interpret his statements and the interval between them? And maybe let's, let's start off with Alana. So um, we've heard this from him before. You know, this is not something that he's doing for the first time and you can interpret it wildly. I mean, although I suppose his, his fans will. Um, but he's done this a number of times where he makes a statement, which is a dog whistle to um, a white supremacist or racist group. And then he waits a few days for them to hear the message. And then he makes his sort of plausible, so he thinks, denial. Um, and this has happened at least three or four times. There's, um, and there's no real doubt that he's what he's trying to do. And, or if there is, at least there's no doubt in the minds of the people who hear him, because certainly the Proud Boys and other white supremacist groups go crazy after he does it. And they all take it as he says it, that he is in favor of their, of their action. He supports what they do. And they're, and you know, they say it very openly. We know he said it, we know he had to take it back, but we know what he really means. So, you know, I, uh, I think it's pretty clear. Anila, how about you? Yeah, hello everybody, glad to be here again. Uh, and I would agree with Rabbi Alana, that's exactly what has happened here. I think it's really important to look at the impact of certain statements. So this statement by uh, by the president uh, during this debate that was watched by a lot of people and specifically how it was interpreted and I would even say celebrated by groups like Proud Boys, like by different neo-Nazi groups, white supremacist groups, they took it as the call to action for them. They they took it and interpreted it exactly, I believe, the way that, uh, that Trump intended it, which is for them to, to hear that call from somebody that they consider, a lot of them consider a hero or a savior in some cases even, and this is a call to action. And it's really concerning that it's coming from the person at the top, you know, the most powerful person or position at least uh, in, in, our, in the world. Uh, and this kind of call being made at a time when there is already so much anxiety, when there is already this buildup 
of uh, militias, of groups preparing for potential civil war even, it really is a scary call to hear that, regardless of how much you try to later say, oh, no, 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 I didn't really mean it, or I do condemn these groups. As Rabbi Alana said, people understand, okay, that's that little wink, wink that you have to do after you come out and, and sort of issue your dog whistle. And I think that's, again, the important point is to say, how did it land on the people who were intended to hear it? Number one, on the groups like Proud Boys, who in fact do engage in violence as part of sort of initiation with their organization, but then also how did others hear it who are going to be the potential victims of that kind of violence? I think those are the two really important uh, measures by which we can determine uh, sort of the, the impact of his statements. Yeah, I know for me, the, I mean, it was, it was an amazingly frightening moment and um, infuriating moment, um, you know, when he's given that opportunity and, and, and he knows who they are. I mean, come on. Um, I mean, he's got to read his, his presidential daily brief, like, you know, once every 10 days or something. So um, he knows exactly who they are. And what, what I found about the statement, it wasn't just the, the stand back and stand by. I mean, that, that, of course, we all know, the Proud Boys turned into a, an internet meme and apparel just immediately, um, you know. So, but it, but it was this. It was the second piece. It was, but I'll tell you what, and and that's the piece that he said with great emotion. I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something. Somebody's got to do something. So now it isn't. You know, we're a democracy. We have we have you know uh, police. We have the FBI. We have people that are designated and authorized to protect the citizens of the country, um, the, the, the things are just completely out of control and that somebody's got to do something. He's authorizing them, as both of you said, for, um, for action, for violent action, for physical action against people that they perceive to be against them. They perceive to be uh, uh, the left. And, and, notice, and notice what Trump did in this. He said something about Antifa and the left. Well, how do you define the left? Who is in the left? Um, and so that's just an, an, an incredibly profoundly disturbing statement from someone elected to serve the entire nation. Uh, it was just incredible. And then the interval, just like you got you all, um, he, he knows exactly what he's doing. And, and what, what, is, what is frustrating to me is that there are so many people in the country who don't seem to recognize, oh, well, he didn't mean it that way or whatever. And that's incredibly naive. Um, so we, we know how the white supremacists are interpreting these words. Um, what threat do you think white supremacy um, and white nationalism, which are similar and yet different uh, phenomena, what, 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 what threat do you think that these groups pose, Anila? Well, we know, according even by the FBI, that white supremacists are the biggest source of threat on U.S. soil. That has been a consistent statistic. Again, the, uh, the perception of a lot of people in our country is not that reality. Uh, there's often a divide between sort of the facts, the reality, and the narrative that is often promoted, where different people, particularly black and brown people, are presented as a threat to, to our country. When in fact, again, study after study, report after report, issued by a variety of different sources, including the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI and others, uh, reaffirmed that, again, the biggest source of threat in our country comes from these sort of white supremacists, right-wing militia types. Uh, so they are a very serious threat, and they should be treated that way as the very serious threat to the safety of all of us. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying they're just a threat to the left or just a threat to Antifa or just a threat to people of color. They are a threat to all Americans. They are a threat to our sort of uh, sort of our country on the whole. And I think that's what we all need to recognize and make a clear distinction between these kinds of groups and individual sort of white supremacists and the white supremacy as an institution and white people. Because I think a lot of people feel like they're getting attacked when we say white supremacists or white nationalism. And I think it's very important for people to draw that very clear distinction. We are talking about people who really are undermining our country's values, our democratic 
institutions who are uh, sort of putting at risk the safety and security of every single one of us as Americans. So I think they're a very serious threat. They need to be taken as a serious threat. And we all need to make sure that it shouldn't be so difficult for anybody to condemn white supremacists, white nationalism, right wing militias. That should be a no brainer. You know, some of these things are a little bit difficult. We get to areas of gray. This is not an area of gray. It is you are either in support of violence and people sort of vigilantes taking violence into their own hands and trying to deliver, you know, law and order or justice, or you are in support of our national institutions, our country's democracy, our founding principles, and this idea that we are all in this together and we come together as a, as a union and we are stronger when we stand united on that and against these forces uh, from within our own country that threaten the safety and security and well-being of all of us, especially the most vulnerable among us. Alana, what do you think? And actually, I, I even want you know, and I, um, I agree with everything Anila said, but I'd actually even want to focus on the second half of his statement, which is the Antifa piece, right? That by, uh, um, first of all, you know, what is Antifa? You know, he, he, the, rather than the fact that Antifa is actually the traditional name and has been since World War II for anti-fascists. There's no group Antifa. Antifa is just people who are anti-fascist. And when our president starts labeling people as Antifa or, you know, any of the other names that he's called, you know, um, people on the left, um, it's actually very dangerous because, you know, this, the next step is really to, you know, start sending military against them or police um, to be violent against this group and treat them as if they are a threat to the country when in fact there's no evidence that that's the case um, and in fact we've already seen that right in Portland we saw these essentially um, you know un unidentified militias kidnapping people off the street people have been shot I mean you know this is your part of the country but you know the rest of the the rest of the country was looking on in horror through this and, um, you know, it, it's, that's the piece, you know, it's bad enough that um, we have a president who dog whistles to white supremacists and white nationalists, and that, you know, he's, he's giving them strength by doing so, but then that he also does the, the opposite side of that, which is, um, you know, attacking citizens who are actually standing for American values against those people, against the people who attack those who have, uh, who are powerless or who are oppressed, those who are targeted by white nationalists and white supremacists, that is truly terrifying. Well, and then what, and what's the, what, what does anti-fascist really mean? It just means not, that, that we're not going to be split up and be divided against each other. I mean, that, that really is what we're talking about. So and to be anti-fascist is really to want to strive for unity amongst the body politic in the United States, in, in, our, in our country. And it was, it was also disturbing to me to, to, to think about how many people, uh, even within, within the Republican Party, were willing to make the young man who went up to Kenosha, Wisconsin and killed two people, make him into some kind of hero. Because he's out there trying to, as he was, was, was claiming, uh, to keep law and order when he is actually doing law, he's actually doing disorder. I mean, he is breaking, so he's actually causing disorder. He, he killed two people and escalated a situation far beyond what it would have been had he not been there. And I'm thinking back to Daniel, or to Tim Snyder's book on tyranny and talking about how you know you're in trouble, you know that democracy has ended when you see, uh, when you see police and paramilitaries or militia groups kind of you know coming together and, and we in fact are seeing some hints of that kind of of conversation uh, right now that's some, some kind of actions like that now I I, I want to be careful um, some of that's just in language and the language of certain parts of the Re Republican Party but but just that whole um, con the fact that that conversation is being normalized really really scares me um, I know that the the local police um, where I live are very concerned about any kind of violence toward anyone, you know, and, and they're not going to put up with any of it. I, I really appreciate that. But just the yeah. fact that that conversation is normalized is problematic. 
Absolutely, Terry. And, you know, you bring up this very good point that we don't know how many Kyle Rittenhousers are going to be, how many individuals are going to sort of take this as a call for them. And it's going to be seen by them, especially if they suffer from sort of other problems or other issues uh, that we know sort of contributes to this need to feel a sense of purpose or to feel like your life means something. We don't know how many people are going to take action and do things that are really horrendous, again, to our fellow uh, uh, country uh, men and women. Uh, we don't know how many of them are going to sort of engage in militia type activities or even threaten governors or other elected leaders in our country, like with what happened in Michigan. We don't know sort of this, this sort of just that um, raising the temperature and really riling people up, which is the way that Trump's comments unfortunately were. And we're hearing it from a lot of other places as well. And I think that's part of, I, I know we will probably get to this later, but sort of in part of like responding to this, we really need to decrease that violence temperature that seems to be sort of really going out uh, and increasing. And especially with knowing what is inevitably going to be uh, sort of chaos post-election, there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot that we need to do in terms of mobilizing and preparing ourselves because of these very real threats. You know, the, the threats are significant. I don't want to undermine them in any way, but I also don't want people to get completely overwhelmed by the threats to the points that to the point that you know they they the, you know fear is immobilizing them. We have a lot of potential power and uh, possibility to do something to be prepared for this, but we have to understand that the threat is very real, and there are groups and individuals. Individuals uh, who have been working towards this kind of, you know, sort of civil war, if you want to call it that, or this kind of uh, prep, prep, uh, prepara preparation for this kind of, you know, what they see as a battle between sort of right and wrong. And we know how sort of the whole dehumanization process works. We know how when you sort of identify people as an enemy, especially enemy of the state, that they are going to be victimized and there is sort of incentive and people engaging in violence in those kinds of settings then are seen as heroes and they want to be seen that way. And we have to make sure that we are prepared to counter that. And that's part of why having these conversations is so critical right now more than ever. I want to, can I, if I could just for a second zero in on something you said about playing the long game. Um, one of the things that I find it extremely concerning is actually how, how much of a long game and how much preparation we actually now are realizing has been happening in these white supremacist, white nationalist groups. So for example, I know um, from friends of mine, rabbis who have served in the military, that it's actually not a new problem that the military has been seated um, for a very long time, at least 20 years, um, with white supremacists and, and white nationalists who have moved up through the ranks. And we also know um, that police departments throughout the country have also been targeted by them. And people who are white nationalists and white supremacists have joined police departments all across the country and also are working their way up through the ranks. And this is not to say that either the military or the police are in and of themselves bad. Quite the contrary, in an ideal, you know, in an ideal situation, both of those are um, organizations which are can be depended upon to, to protect people who otherwise might not have protection. And that's what we want, right? We want to be able to figure out ways to say, look, we are going to, we see that these groups are working to taint these organizations and we need to figure out a way to remove them. Um, and I, that's another thing which I think a lot of us um, are, we haven't been paying enough attention to. This is not something that happened in the last four years, but we've let it go, right? There wasn't enough, there wasn't enough um, ferment about it for us to think like, oh yeah, we've really got to do something about this. Finally, now, we're coming to the realization that if we don't do something about it, it, it goes all the way to the top. Yeah. You know, so I, I just want to say that, um, you know, in every, in, in every case where this kind of thing gets out of control, uh, there, are, there are some people who see the, the problem taking place, and there's a big swath of people who just can't be bothered or don't think it's that big a deal or think that people are just making stuff up. Uh, in Anacortes here, um, you know, you know, as, as you all know, I mean, I, I was targeted by a vehicle. Another group of people were targeted by a vehicle. And, uh, and there's been a lot of Black Lives Matter protests and demonstrations downtown, very peaceful. Uh, but um, a lot of, you know, 
yelling and screaming and dehumanizing language toward them, which is why I go down there a lot wearing my collar and my stole and everything. And of course they yell and scream at me because they know that, that uh, how it looks, that it looks like people of faith are standing with, you know, the Black Lives Matter protesters. So right on the corner where we've been protesting, uh, people put up stickers on the light poles, which is illegal. And it was for the, it's for a movement called the Rise Above Movement, which is like the Proud Boys. It's kind of a, a right-wing racist fight club uh, anti-leftist fight club and so what they want to do is is you know gear up and come down and they they get they get certain uh, privileges within their group if they uh if they beat people up and uh, and so this has been going on just in little old Anacortes, you know fifteen thousand people you know and, it, and it's here so i guess what i'm wondering is you know could we explore a little bit about what not the impact of the groups but at the impact of the fear is having on our communities and i'm wondering if you might might start us off, Anila. Sure. I mean, the, the groups that are often targeted, uh, people of color, particularly with anti-Black racism, uh, Muslims and Jewish people, particularly with Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. Uh, I mean, all of these various forms of oppression, uh, the, the homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, uh, along with the ones I mentioned, they are all directly connected and they are all being sort of advanced in really ugly ways. Um, and they're used and manipulated as well. Uh, and part of what we are seeing is, as, as Rabbi Alana mentioned before, that this is not new. This has been going on and building up for a really long time time. And we have had communities that are directly impacted speaking up and talking about this for, you know, year after year, decade after decade, and it has gone unaddressed mostly at a really large institutional level. Um, and we're, you know, seeing this national uprising now for racial justice, which is very long overdue. Uh, so we are seeing a little bit of a different conversation now. But the reality is that this has been going on for so long, and the communities that are directly impacted have been feeling the carrying the brunt of this sort of racism, um, Islamophobia, xenophobia, all of this stuff, they've been carrying it. Um, and the fear that comes with that, with comes with that, that comes with the increase in hate crimes, that comes with the increase in bigotry and discrimination and everyday people walking around and being attacked, being assaulted, facing sort of direct threats and, and all kinds of stuff, it has absolutely had an increase on anxiety, on fear, on people sort of turning inward. It has had the impact of people sort of not knowing who to trust, um, uh, it has created a divisiveness in our country. There have been very real consequences in addition to the very real actual uh, violence that has uh, occurred as well. So the threat is very, very real. And I want to add, and I, I don't know if this necessarily fits here, but I want to add that it's not just the sort of militias and the right-wing groups and the white supremacists. It is the everyday, the microaggressions and the ongoing very real racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, all of this stuff that we experience even within sort of the sort of liberal communities, even within sort of leaders who speak beautiful, eloquent words, but then their, their actions actually contradict the beautiful rhetoric that they may be promoting. I mean, we experienced this with the city of Redmond and the leadership there, where they're very happy to say things like, we stand with you, our Muslim neighbors. But when it came to a, a group actually promoting hate against Muslims very uh, severely and, and in a very sort of documented way, we were able to identify all of their comments. Um, uh, the majority of, of the Redmond City Council, unfortunately, could not come out and say that we condemn this specific kind of hate. That seems so simple. Again, it's one of those issues that shouldn't should be a no brainer, but unfortunately, it wasn't. So I want to be very clear that this is not a partisan problem. It is a nonpartisan problem across the board, and the fear and anxiety that results from that uh, is very real, is very consequential. Um, but I don't want to take away from the the incredible strength and resilience that communities of color, Muslim communities and others have shown even in the face of really ugly hatred and even violence. Alana? I mean, I don't have a lot to add to that. It's um, the fear has real impact. And as, as Anila has said, right, it's not simply just what's been happening over the last few years. I mean, so for my community, you know, we can see that actually you get generational trauma, right? We still see the impact of World War II and the Holocaust on like the grandchildren of people who survived it. And I, I, that's certainly also true in the Black community. And, you know, I, 
I, and, and many other communities that are targeted by these groups. And really what is our job right now is to protect those groups and to protect the people who are visible targets every day, particularly people of color, women wearing a hijab or headscarf or, or any other visible markings, because those are the people who are in the front. You know, I, I think uh, many months ago, you know, one of the topics that we talked about was like, who in your community is the, are the visible ones, right? For, for the Muslim community, it's often women, right? In the Jewish community, it's often men, um, you know, and of course, if you're a person of color, it's everybody who's of color. Um, and those are the people who we really need to be like putting our arms around and, and protecting them in whatever way we can to prevent that trauma from continuing. Um, and certainly at this time where you see it ramping up and getting worse, we really need to be stepping up now to act. And it's, I, I, it is hard to, uh, how to, hard to know what to do now day to day when we're all kind of trying to figure out how not to get sick as well. Like that's a real conundrum, right? How do you act? You know, how do you take action? How do you go out into the public sphere and still keep, keep yourself and your family safe and also act to protect from these other things that are happening at the same time? And it's, um, you know, there's a lot to think about there. Yeah, I really appreciate what both of you said. Um, so I think there's a there's a fear that I think the fear is working to, as you both said, to have people withdraw from the public space. And of course, COVID makes that so complicated as well. But e even perhaps to withdraw from voting because it's going to feel dangerous, you know. And that's that I think is part of the of the danger of the some of the rhetoric out there, um, particularly by President Trump. Uh, but by others as well, trying to say, hey, you know, voting is dangerous and it might not work anyway and your vote might not count, so don't bother voting. All that's extremely disturbing. But I think the other, the other component of it is, is, you all said perfectly, which is that we can get so focused on white supremacists that we do not look at the way, at the way our country has been built on a caste system where some people are important and some people aren't. And, and just the, the daily grind of that and, and the way that that divides us as a people as well. And, I, and so I think it's very easy for people, you know, who are white to sit back and say, well, I'm not a white supremacist. Um, not recognizing the ways in which they may participate actively, unconsciously um, or consciously um, in sort of this ongoing bullying and, and status keeping uh, within, our, within our own nation. And, and, and what I hear people of color asking for and people of different religious, different religious minorities in this country is just that America live up to our stated aspirational values. And that that doesn't mean that there's gonna be less for white people. It means that there's gonna be a bigger Thanksgiving table. There's gonna be a bigger meal, a table set out for everybody and where, where, uh, where people can contribute to this country in a way that helps build up everybody's uh, safety and well-being, not a zero-sum game where we're gonna we're gonna have stuff taken from from white folk. And I, I think this whole conversation is very confusing for people. And part of the way the fear works is is denial that well I'm not one of those violent folk. But you may be a person. We may be people who are silent in the face of it, which we know the the that great acts of terror in in the world like the Holocaust could not have happened had people stood up and spoken and said no in mass numbers. So, oh man, get me going. Okay, so what do you think uh, is the potential chances and the impact of, of some election violence as, as so many people have been talking about? Uh, Alana? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, it's a real question. So I know that, so as part of the Poor People's Campaign here, here in Maryland, we think in this state, there's probably not likely to be a lot of violence, but depending on what happens, right? Depending on how successful the voter suppression is or the outcome of the votes, or, you know, there's so many variables here. It could very well happen in other places. Um, and there are, you know, there are certain parts of the country where I think it's more likely um, to occur. Uh, almost no matter what the outcome is, honestly. Um, and it's, it's a real concern. I know one of the things here I, I mentioned um, earlier before we got on the call that 
what we're thinking about here in Maryland in the Poor People's Campaign is training people to do nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, should it be necessary? God willing, it won't be. But that people really need to be prepared to go out in the street as safely as possible, um, not completely nonviolently. You know, everyone's going to wear masks and distance as much as possible, but we need people to be prepared to go. Um, and while that does entail some risk to us as individuals from COVID, if nothing else, um, I, I think that that in itself, if we really turned out people like the way people turned out for the first women's march, if we saw that, if we saw something like that, if we saw mass mobilization across the country, I think that that would do a great deal to tamp down the threat of violence. Um, so that's, I mean, that's what I would encourage people is to speak with your feet, you know, pray with your feet as Heschel would have said, um, you know, pray with your feet, go out there and walk. And if you do, and if you bring your neighbors and you bring your family and you bring your cousins and you bring your church and your synagogue and your mosque, and we're all out there in the street distanced and masked together, enough of us out there on the streets, that by itself might, might well be enough. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I hope. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll ask Anila to go last on this one. I, I just gonna say that I, I've been thinking a lot about the, the media bubbles that people are in, the very different senses of reality that folk are, are, are part of right now. Like, you know, QAnon is, a, is an extreme example of this, um, where, you know, where the, the stuff that they think are, of our facts, um, wow, I mean, the unverified, you know, stuff built, <laughs> I mean, it's not even a house of cards that, that these folk are, are getting excited about. But there are so many people out there that just cannot imagine that Donald Trump could lose. And, and so the fact that we're even having a conversation about the potential for election violence is itself just absolutely astounding and, and, uh, and difficult all by itself. But I, I think you're right, Alana, that, again, um, this is a moment where, where, where people of goodwill who care about democracy and want to see it furthered and deepened are, are going to have to do more than just yell at the TV. Um, we're, we're going to have to get we're going to have to be ready to to get out and stand up, not only vote, but but perhaps prepare to get out and stand up on the streets and say, this is not the way this is not the direction we're going to go. And um, and I, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of folk that are willing to do that. And, I, and I, I, I'm encouraged. Um, Anila, what do you think? So um, I think that there is a very real potential for violence, uh, particularly given the, the potential scenarios that are going to happen. Uh, I worry very much that Trump has done an effective job, especially with his base, of convincing him, uh, convincing them that there is this uh, potential for voter fraud and not to trust the you know votes by mail and everything else. So if we get on election night, uh, you know, especially in the middle of a pandemic with a lot of states offering different versions of mail-in voting that they are not used to uh, and sort of the, the counting of those ballots and everything else. You know, if we have uh, election night uh, where media, particularly if they're not responsible with how they present the potential results, uh, if we get, you know, what people have been calling this red mirage, where it appears that Trump has won because a lot of the mail-in ballots have not been counted yet, and those, uh, at least according to experts uh, tend to be Democrats uh, more than Republicans. So if you get that kind of scenario where you have this red mirage, where it looks like Trump is ahead, even if by the, the tiniest, tiniest margin, and then all of a sudden the mail-in ballots show something different, that is really going to be the scenario in which we're going to see the very the real uh, chance of violence in, in my mind. Um, then you have the scenario of it being the other way. Uh, will there be violence if there's a potential, I, I don't know if that's that's not what the polls are showing right now, that Biden would come out ahead, but then Trump would win. That's not what the polls are showing, but I feel like the violence might be slightly less. But what could be very real then is if we do, did have Trump win a second term, that can really lead to some dire consequences for a lot of communities that are directly impacted by harmful policies and uh, the sort of dog whistles that have been sent to individual groups and and 
you know, different militias and, and things like that. Um, if you look again around the world, if you look at these instances where people in positions of power have used scapegoating and dog whistling and some of the tactics that we've seen President Trump use, and then they get reelected, they see that as a sort of reinforcement of what they've been doing, no matter how dangerous it's been to so many. So they sort of double down on that. We saw that with Modi, for instance, with India and the kind of very clear violence against the Muslims, uh, the Christians, uh, Dalits and others in India. So I fear that kind of potential for violence in that way as well. Um, I think the only real way to avoid the violence is if there is an overwhelming, clear winner uh, and if the winner is is Biden, that nobody can dispute the results sort of on election day and with the mail-in ballots just you know, reconfirming uh, uh, the, the votes. And I am not a Biden supporter, so I will put that out there. I'm not a, a Biden supporter, but I feel like in terms of avoiding violence, that that will be the best scenario for potentially having a peaceful transition of power. At the same time, you have so many people, millions now, who are the base of Trump, who are not going to go away anytime, even if there is a Biden victory, they're not going to just disappear or go away quietly. We're going to have to face this. And that's why it's so critical for different leaders, for faith leaders, for community leaders, for elected leaders, and especially for people, members of the Republican Party, to really step up now more than ever and make sure they are on point in their messaging and they convey something to be able to bring in a lot of these people who are are disillusioned, who are disaffected, who are feeling like Trump is their person. And if they don't get Trump, they're willing to burn down the whole country for it. Like we need to reach those folks and it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to require sort of part, you know, nonpartisan work uh, and collaboration across the board to help preserve something bigger than all of us, you know, our, our well-being as a country, as a nation uh, really moving forward. Thank you, Anila. And I, that, that really is a great segue into, into the next question, sort of, you know, focus for the evening here, which is, you know, we're very, we're very focused as a nation on the presidential and other elections right now. Um, how should people be thinking about how to use our energies once the election is certified? Um, what are your concerns about how people may respond with either result? Like, um, how do we think about the future and the kind of work that's ahead of us? Um, I'm wondering, Anila, if you, if you would go first. Sure. Uh, I think this is the, the place that we really, as especially as people of faith, we really need to focus. And the reason I say that is because there's going to be chaos, it seems, no matter, you know, all these different scenarios are going to have a level of chaos in them. Uh, and there are a lot of problems that we as a nation are facing at a political level, at an individual level, at an economic level, moral level. We have all of these different aspects. And I think it's going to be more critical than ever for us to address them, understanding the connection between these various issues. I think some of the immediate things that we need to do, uh, as I mentioned, is, and as Rabbi Alana mentioned that she's been involved in, is preparing for the post-election, you know, that that period between uh, election night and inauguration is going to be a critical sort of three-month period. That's going to be when we all have to sort of be willing to put ourselves on the line, be out there, do our part, really mobilize and show the, the sort of people power uh, that we need to see out on the streets. We also need leaders, especially faith leaders, because there are faith communities in every city, you know, every community, every city across our nation. We really need faith leaders and faith communities to address some of the underlying root problems of the kinds of things that we're seeing. You know, this idea of tribalism and otherization, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism, Racism, racism in general, xenophobia, toxic masculinity, you know, Western male chauvinism, all of these are things that really need to be addressed um, as sort of faith institutions. We really need to get to the point of addressing some of these roots of the problem that are allowing for this kind of um, dividedness that we're seeing that's really hurting all of us. Uh, I have more ideas, but I'll stop there and then add some more maybe later. Alana, what do you have to say? So, Certainly, um, I, I would agree with what Anila said in terms of preparation. I would also add, I think right now, one of the things we really need to be focusing on, even before the election, in terms of preparing for that period between November and January, is um, really focusing on um, pushing your local representatives, or all of your representatives, whatever you have, county, state, anything, um, to make sure that they commit uh, publicly to counting every vote, including the votes, you know, all of the, all of the absentee ballots, all of the mail-ins, 
that that is something that we can do now to prepare. Um, and if that's that's a huge thing that we need to um, we need to get focused on that piece of it just in terms of having an honest and fair election. And then of course, Anila is correct in that once that happens and we do sort of, you know, we do get all of those votes counted and whoever is elected is elected, that from that period, from November to January, um, we're going to have to start building alliances and structures that will make sure that we can push forward the, um, the results of that election, that they happen without violence insofar as that's possible, God willing. Um, and I would also add that in addition to having our, um, our leaders focus on um, breaking down the white nationalism and the, the white supremacism that we're seeing and having that not just faith leaders, also um, other public leaders, I think the other piece of it is also to recognize that there are these other things that go into that, right? Like we can't really separate white supremacy and white nationalism from the fears that people have about other areas in their lives. Like if you're, if you're poor and white and you live in a rural place where you're surrounded by other people who are also poor and can't get a job, you know, that's not, you know, and then you see these sort of you know, people who seem to be laughing at you because you're poor and white, no. that's not going to be um, conducive to a, like an open-hearted response to others. And so I, I think it's really important for us to also just really focus on that these are, these are long-term problems, which we've been in place for possibly hundreds of years at this point, right? That, you know, it's part of the system that we live in it's a bit of a pendulum, but right now we're in one of the worst periods, right? Where people who are poor have access to less and less and people who there's fewer and fewer people who have access to more and more, right? That, you know, the one percenters, right? Who really have access to more than half of the wealth in, the, in this country, let alone in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's really something that we have to address. And that is a political problem, right? It's not, that isn't a, that's not a white supremacy problem or white nationalism problem, but it contributes directly to it because the people who want to maintain and grow their money and their power use white nationalists and use white supremacists to do so as part of the system. So, you know, it's not even just November to January. This is a really long-term project and it's going to be very difficult because the people with the money and the power don't want to change it, right? They're going to want to keep aggregating it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's so I, I want to I'll start off this way. I think um, I think that that you're both right about about all of it. Like, I also think that at some point, uh, folk are going to have to re hit, hit a reset button for themselves. And maybe we can all do it at different times and stages. So enough of us are all staying active. But I think I think that we all are going to need to take a couple of days and maybe a, a couple of weeks and find some time to rest and hit the hit the reset button, you know, once the election is certified and it looks like, you know, transitions are gonna happen. Like, um, because, uh, but I think the other side of it is we're gonna have to re-enter the fray after that. Because think about back to the earlier part of the conversation, white nationalist, white supremacist groups, I mean, they're all thinking super long-term they have ideologies. They have. They're using the the social media and YouTube and other you know forums to try to catch people in who are feeling like life has let them down, that life's very complicated, and they're looking for a simple answer and a simple you know idea about who to blame for their problems, and uh, um, you know are, are fearful of people of color, are fearful that the, the way white people have treated people of color in this country is gonna be reversed. Instead of us moving to a next way for us to live together, that we're just gonna flip the script, you know? Um, so they're thinking long-term and we've got to think long-term too. And for this, I wanna call faith communities into, into account. Like who cares how many people you have in your pews or your seats or on your prayer rugs you know, whenever you pray. I mean, I think that's important, right? We all want more people to come and all that. But how about if we recognize that 
the people that are lonely in our neighborhood are potential victims for these white nationalist and hate group people. That the people who are um, have some kind of you know emotional disability or intellectual disability are are, are potential targets. That people who are poor who do not have a job as the result of, of the fourth industrial revolution or whatever, or whatever it is, um, that those folk are, are targets of these folk. And we've got to start, and we've got to start thinking about rural areas and, uh, and, and, and be out there and in, in conversation with people in rural areas and, uh, and, and help and speak to them with respect mm -hmm. about with the challenges that they have are going through and with the contributions that they make to our well being as a nation. And so we've got to be thinking long term and not just say, OK, my 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 guy won. Of course, right now it's a guy. My guy won. So everything's good. I can go back to not paying attention to things like that is not where we are as a nation right now. Like we have we have all got to like take a break, hit the reset button, maybe not look at 538, you know, for election forecast every single day. Right. We've got to maybe watch a little less news. But we've got to all, all pick a movement, pick an issue, and then work collaboratively with uh, collaboratively with other people, uh, because uh, our our nation is not only on a precipice right now. We are going to be in this weakened, vulnerable state for some time, and and it's going to take all of us to 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 get things moving in a better direction. A absolutely, and I just wanted to add, uh, Reverend Terry, that specifically, you know, this this idea of economic well-being is so critical. Uh, you're both right. You both mentioned this that there are so many people who are directly impacted by the political decisions, both at the federal level, state, and local level, uh, and we need to help uh, so change policies to be able to serve the people in need, to actually serve the people and put people over profits in our country. Uh, for far too long, since Citizens United and and beyond we've had uh, a real sort of uh push towards having even our elected leaders support corporate interests over people's interests. And this sort of idea of using things like white nationalism, like racism, like Islamophobia, like anti-Semitism, all of these various forms of oppression as scapegoating tools to keep people fighting within you know, themselves rather than looking at the policies that are directly impacting them that are actually the source of a lot of their uh, problems in, in life, uh, that, that sort of education uh, uh, and that sort of sort of understanding and movement building really needs to happen. That movement building is going to be so critical after you know the election is certified, as, as you mentioned. Uh, we of course need time for a break, but we really have to do that kind of movement work and bring people of all faith backgrounds, people of all racial backgrounds, ages, you know, genders, sexual orientation, uh, class, partisan background. It does not matter. We need to bring people together and unite, sort of, in this kind of movement to create real change that benefits the actual people of our country. The other thing that I think we really need to invest in, and I hope uh, the next administration will do this regardless of who it is, is you know, there are groups that have done this kind of work of uh, uh, helping bring people back once they've been sort of co-opted or uh, sort of brainwashed, let's say, by some of these kinds of groups that are really dangerous to the well-being of our country. There's a group in, in, in Chicago, I believe, the Life After Hate organization, um, and they've done some incredible work of bringing back sort of white nationalists, white supremacists uh, back and helping them sort of overcome whatever issues they were facing so they could then integrate in society and not be supportive of these kinds of violent elements in our uh, in our country. Unfortunately, they've had their funding uh, cut uh, from a federal level. They had a level of funding under the Trump, uh, under the Obama administration that was unfortunately cut under the Trump administration. And part of the reason it was cut is because of the focus away from the actual source of threat of white supremacists in our country and instead moving it towards people of color and communities of color. So I think we really need to invest in those kinds of groups and organizations that can help bring sort of people back into sort of the, the normal sort of society uh, and, and help them uh, be rehabilitated, basically. And I, I just want to say out loud something that's sort of a subtext here and particularly important because the three of us are people of faith, that what we're really talking about here is, you know, there's this, this is one of my rare critiques. I'm going to target the left here, which is we like to talk about religion and politics as though they're completely separate, unrelated things, and they are not. The Torah... The, the Christian Bible and the Quran are all political documents, which require, not political in the sense of like 
we, you know, this particular politician is the right politician, but in the sense that politics is a way that we interact with each other on a large scale, right? It's about the policies that, that help shape our society. And the Torah, the Quran, the, the Christian Bible, all three of those, right, are, are documents which lay out very clear guidelines about how that happens. And I think that it's, you know, it has been a mistake to sort of relegate religion to, you know, that's where you go one day a week and, you know, or, you know, whatever, that's when you say your prayers, right? It's really about what you do all the time. And I think that's one of the places where not just the extremists, but the right in general really actually has a, a strong critique um, of the way our society is currently going in the sense that those people who are open to be targeted by extremists, they're lonely, right? They are, they are desperate for connection. They're not, you know, the fear doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes because they have no connection to a, a network that will support them. And when, you know, so then when somebody comes and says, well, we'll make sure you don't go hungry. And by the way, you know, who's at fault? Well, the reason you're hungry is those people over there who are, you know, taking your rightful place, whether a rightful place means your job or whether it means that, you know, there needs to be somebody who's a different color than you below you on the ladder, right? That they, it gives them a view of the world that things can slot into place. And all of a sudden like, okay, it's not really my fault that I'm here, which is to a certain extent true, right? They too are victims of this larger, larger political problem, but we need to give them a better solution. And, I, and that's really what we're, all three of us have been talking about all, all night. In fact, it's what we usually talk about all the time. Um, but we don't always put it in religious terms. And I think that's a mistake. I think we really do need a religious revival in this country, just not one kind of religious revival. We need a religious revival that has room for all of us to be deeply embedded in our own traditions. You know, it, it doesn't require one religion in the world, right? It requires us each to be embedded in the tradition that we have and we can share the best parts of it with each other without requiring other people to join us. You know, I so agree with that. And, and of course, you know, because of the ways some authoritarian uh, uh, Christians, especially, or, or white supremacist Christians operate in which they think that their view must be supreme and must be hegemonic, may, must be the only view, uh, that then you know, progressives, because of that and, and other historical factors that think that we should just not engage our religious points of view um, as we as we engage in the larger democratic process. It's not about imposing our view on somebody else. It's about bringing the best we have into that situation. And I think all three of our traditions, you know, in the words of one theologian that I really respect, um, said that God cares about the real condition of human beings. God cares about the real condition of human beings. And the way we determine so much of that real condition today is through our, our political process of making decisions as a people in a democracy. And we ought to be able, we ought to be able, not only be able, we ought to, we ought to bring uh, the best of our, of our, of our uh, values and perspectives into that public space while creating at the same time space for people of other traditions, including atheists and agnostics and others. And, and so I think there's got to be a way to do that. I was reading a book here about, about the way, uh, I'm reading a book right now about how Christians sort of formed their churches to allow for white supremacy and slavery. And one of the tricks that they used was actually kind of an enlightenment trick. You know, John Locke basically said that religion is just all about your personal, private, spiritual, whatever you do in your closet routine. And they basically said that too, that, that, when, that when, uh, when, when people who were enslaved were baptized, that baptism would not impact their, their, their chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. In fact, part of the baptismal covenant was you have to promise that you're not trying to remove yourself from being enslaved. And so that, that was cemented into, into the church in this country, the, the difference between personal and spiritual stuff, theological issues, and the public sphere. 
which totally undercuts the entire notion of the Abrahamic tradition, which is it's okay for you to have a nation, for you to be a nation, but you got to care about the well-being of other nations, of other tribes, of other families. It, it just totally undercuts love of self and love of neighbor and makes it into just a mockery. And so we have to get like, if, if progressives and liberals would just like get over that <laughs> and learn how to play in that public space and that public debate with the best of what we have, we'd be in such a different place right now. I just, I, you know, the only thing I could think of when you were saying that is, right, you know, in Genesis, when Abraham, who's the father of all of us, right? Yeah. And, and God says, you're going to be a blessing to all of the other nations, right? You can't be a blessing unless you interact with them and you strengthen them, right? So that should be like a commit, you know, that's like a, a, a calling to all three of us, all, all of three of our peoples, right? That we need to be a blessing, right? The power of blessing is in our hands, but you got to give it away. Yep, I absolutely agree. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us that the best of us are those who bring the most benefits of society. And right now that call to bring benefits of society is so loud and clear. And I'll also add based on what both of you said, with what I agree with what you said, but specifically this idea of coming together and having multi-faith gatherings or multi-faith opportunities to do this work. Because I will tell you something, even the people who are atheist or agnostic, I've literally heard it from from those individuals as well, that they are moved, even though they are not of any religious background, they are moved when they see, you know, Muslim, Christian, Jew, Hindu, Sikh, you know, whatever you might have, come together and take a united moral stand on the issues of justice that matter of the day. And when they see that, I've literally seen atheists and agnostics shed tears because they've been moved by it. So you can imagine that people of religious backgrounds would also be moved by it and, and have been. And it's really, really powerful. And I think we don't give enough weight or credence to that role and that possibility for faith leaders and faith communities to do really transformational work. And we've seen it. And I, I love seeing things like the Poor People's Campaign because they try to do exactly that. And it's so critical and it's gonna be needed moving forward uh, sort of now more than ever. Yeah, I think we completely misunderstand the power of when we act together because it, it not only are we working on an issue, we're working on an issue by working on the issue together. We're actually modeling a way for us to think about, about humanity. I mean, I think the Abrahamic tradition was trying and it's not perfect, it's not any kind of foolproof thing, but what it's trying to do is to help us recognize the humanity in other people, recognize that the diversity of human nature, of human beings, human nations, human families, human cultures, human religions, is an intentional part of the created world. And that, and that as I think Islam says, you know, so, so beautifully, as the Quran says so beautifully, I made you to nations and tribes so you may know and enjoy and experience and encounter one another, right? Um, I think that's all baked right into the Abrahamic tradition. And so when we come together, we can actually model like how we can be passionately believing what we believe. And because of that, not in spite of it, but because of that, work for a, a better world together. I think that that's just so powerful right now. Absolutely, fully agree. Well, we have a lot of work to do, uh, friends. Um, I, I hope that, that everyone gets through the next couple of weeks, uh, takes some deep breaths and, some and make some prayers and go for walks and eat some good food. And uh, remember that the, the, the current drama is is not uh, is not the the end of anything. It, it is perhaps the kind of the the, the shaking and the, the the disorientation that's needed for something new to be birthed in this country, and new to be birthed in us. And I hope all of us can lean into that, and uh, take a deep breath when we get when we need to, and then uh, get back into action next year, and not not go back into passivity because somebody wins and somebody else loses, uh, because uh, our world and our and our nation and the creation need us right now. So right. with that, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and close up the, 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 the night. I'm so thankful, Anila, for you being here, and Alana, for you. And what we miss Hamza tonight, we'll, we'll look forward to, to seeing him soon. Um, Past to Understanding, you can find more about us at pastounderstanding.org. 
Um, we want you to, to be sure and look up the Pomegranate Initiative um, on Facebook. Look up the uh, Maps Amen on Facebook as well. Um, and uh, check out our Facts of Fear campaign to counter anti-Muslim bigotry, which is still going. And, and until we see you again, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Thanks for watching.